Okay, our final panel is on trials, uh, and we have a, a, a remarkable uh, group of people here. Uh, our moderator is Stephanie Schanberg from uh, Morrison and Forrester, and I'm going to let her introduce the panel. All right. Thanks, Mark. And thank you for pulling together a panel that really needs no introduction. And I mean, people say that a lot, but it's actually true of this panel. Um, nonetheless, for anyone who's new to our community, to my left is Paul Graywall. He's a VP and um, Deputy General Counsel at Facebook. And of course, many of us know him from his days as a magistrate judge for the Northern District of California. To his left is Judge Beth Lapson Freeman. And um, you know, I tried to think of something interesting to say about each of you guys. Um, the best dancer on the Northern District of California judiciary, <laughs> bar none. <laughs> That was that was truly impressive. Um, and then next to next to Judge Freeman is Sonal Mehta from um, Dury Tongri, and Sonal is a good friend and an excellent lawyer with a robust and busy trial practice. Um, I was watching her read depot transcripts in the audience today. Um, she can't even put that down for a half an hour. Um, and next to next to Sonal is legendary trial lawyer Morgan Chu from Irella Manila. And um, I want to come back to Sonal for a second and say in like 10 years, I expect to be describing you as legendary trial lawyer as well. And but it's you. it's too soon for either of us to really to go it's with okay. legendary. It's okay. Yeah. You never. At least, at least, yeah, at least not enough gray hair that we're letting anyone see. So thank you guys for being here late on a Friday afternoon. Um, it's really a compliment to us and to the panel that you stuck around to hear what we have to say about trying patent cases to juries, trying complex technology cases, and um, best practices in doing so. I thought an interesting way to start this panel out was to ask the panelists to each share, or at least those of us who have experience interviewing jurors, the most interesting thing that we've ever heard from a jury or an individual juror after we've tried a case when we do the juror interviews. Um, I think that is the most interesting part of the trial, is when you get to meet out in the hallway and ask people questions as to what they actually heard um, relative to what you intended for them to hear during the course of your trial. And um, I was going to start out and ask Morgan that question. What's the most interesting or perhaps frightening thing you've ever heard a jury say? <laughs> I thought of actually two very quick stories. One was a case that involved data compression. And one of our difficulties was there was a lot of complexity to data compression and technical terms and whatnot. So we simplified it to say that the patent donor's data compression involved a yellow sliding window. So in cross-examining the other side's experts, we could say this piece of prior art did not have a yellow sliding window. It didn't even have a sliding window. And we could do that throughout the trial with fact witnesses and expert witnesses because we had compressed all of the technical jargon into these simple concepts of the color yellow and a sliding window. End of trial, the four-person with a master's degree said, boy, if I heard you talk one more time about that yellow sliding window, I thought I was going to throw up. <laughs> uh, the second quick story. But at least they remembered the yellow sliding window. Excuse me? At least they remembered it. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Uh, it, it did make direct and cross-examination a lot easier. And it was an easy way to distinguish all of the prior art. And it was an easy way uh, to get admissions from the other side that they used this yellow uh, sliding window as defined by our side. <laughs> the, the other was a comment. Again, it was from the foreperson at the end of a jury trial, we were representing the defendant, and he was complimentary of everyone, and he said, Mr. Chu, we really like your cross-examinations. You stepped over the toes of all of the key witnesses on the other side, and you never scuffed their shoes. <laughs> Which is interesting. Because a lot of people think about lawyers in cross-examination as being mean and tough and getting admissions of a, a, a major nature. And what they really enjoyed 
was getting admissions in a very polite fashion where they understood all the points and one didn't need to be even a tad bombastic or be the television-like cross-examiner. Mm -hmm. Paul, I know you had stories as well. Yeah, I have a lot of stories. I, I have to say one of, the, one of the things I miss most about my uh, experience on the bench was the opportunity to talk to juries after trial. Um, and, and, you know, in the position of a judge, you tend to get a bit more candor um, and a bit more detail from, from jurors than maybe you might as trial counsel. The, the, the story, though, that sticks out forever in my mind after a particular patent jury trial is one in which after, you know, 10 days or two weeks, a verdict is returned, the, the parties packed up their bags, and nearly everybody went home. Well, one juror in particular didn't really want to go home. He seemed to want to stick around in the jury room long after everybody else had cleared out. And it was clear to me he had something he wanted to share with me. So when my clerk told me about this person still lingering, juror number six or whatever, uh, I went into the jury room and I asked him what he wanted to talk about. And he, and he looked up at me and he stared at me and he began to sp speak with a somewhat accented form of English, even though his vocabulary, his diction, his grammar was immaculate. And he asked me, have you considered having judges resolve these issues of fact rather than juries? <laughs> and <laughs> the accent I, I, I picked up in his voice was Bavarian. And so I asked him, by any chance, uh, are you German? And he said, no, actually, I'm from New Jersey. I just want to know, <laughs> have you ever considered having judges try patent cases instead of juries? And he then proceeded to ask me why we would not consider the question of validity before turning to the question of infringement in some type of bifurcated fashion. Uh, <laughs> turns out... Again, suggesting to you wow. that you might have been right about where he was from. <laughs> suggesting exactly that if I was wrong about Bavaria, perhaps he was from Dusseldorf. I don't know. <laughs> But he was insistent. And as it turned out, he was not a patent person. He was wow. neither a patent agent nor a lawyer. He was not an engineer. He was simply asking a very good question mm -hmm. on a question I think many of us have asked, uh, or on a topic, rather. We've asked many questions about ourselves. That's fascinating. Um, I, I have one quick story I'll share. So earlier this year, I had the pleasure of trying a case with Daryl and Dury, actually in front of Judge Freeman. And Darylin did a beautiful cross-examination, we thought, of the other side's CEO, during which she played video clips of his deposition testimony where he said precisely the opposite of what he was testifying to at trial. <laughs> and after the trial, we went out into the hallway and interviewed jurors, and we asked specifically what the reaction was to that cross-examination, which our team celebrated as incredibly effective. And the reaction was, that man's really learned a lot since his deposition. <laughs> so how do we, as litigants and judges, educate jurors that that's not OK? <laughs> We're going to turn to that now. <laughs> when you have no idea that they could even have come to that conclusion. You know, we want to talk about signposting and statements and how to get the message across to juries as to what we're really trying to communicate. Does that surprise you? That shocks me. <laughs> it shocked us as well. Wow. <laughs> so, you know, Judge Freeman made a comment when we were preparing for the panel today that really stuck with me and I've been thinking about a lot lately. And that is that sometimes the trial themes that lawyers select and juror comprehension are mutually exclusive. So for instance, you might have a plaintiff who wants to talk about how great an invention is, but doesn't really drill down into the details of the claim language and an infringement analysis. So I wanna talk to Sonal first and Morgan about how you select your trial themes and how you make sure that you not only come up with a theme that's understandable to the jury, but that's also true to the case. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the reasons that that happens a lot, which is the disconnect between the kind of narrative theme that you want to weave into your opening and your closing and the actual case that you need to present so that you've met your burden of proof and you have the evidence to hold up on appeal, is that different people are thinking about those two parts of the case. And one 
part of that is being done early on and one part is often not being thought about until much later. And so from my perspective, probably the biggest way to harmonize those two things and make sure you have a cohesive story that is both narratively and thematically going to be compelling to the jury and also actually connects to the merits of the case and the patent claims that you're gonna to have to have your expert get up there and do the claim charts with, is to have somebody that's going to be doing the trial thinking about that very early on in the case. So it is important, of course, to have people go and, and you know, look at the code or talk to the engineers and figure out what your facts are, but it's important to have the person that's doing that in the first stages of the case also be thinking about how are we going to present this to the jury? How does this fit in with the story of the plaintiff and the defendant? So it's not just David versus Goliath, but it's David versus Goliath on this particular technology. This is how this invention fits into David versus Goliath. And these are the witnesses that are going to tell that story in a compelling way to the jury. And in making sure your witnesses actually know that story and are prepared to deliver it in deposition and throughout the case. So Morgan, I'd be interested to hear about how you develop themes for trial, as well as whether you do so differently when you're plaintiff versus defendant. Well, first of all, when I started out trying cases, I thought about the themes that would be best for our side. And after a while, I said, that's backwards. I spend more time thinking about the other side's themes first. And the other side's themes, I spent a lot of time thinking about them, not at the high level. David and Goliath, I think, is at a high level. That's a way to think about themes. Or from an inventor's point of view, the inventor came up with this terrific invention, brought great things to consumers. Or from a defendant's point of view, that they developed a product on their own and they sweated and invested a lot of money and took a lot of risks. Those are the themes at the high level. So now I think about the other sides first and then think about how we'll combat that and how does that match with the themes that we would like to put forward affirmatively. The second step I learned over time was to test it. And the way to test it, it's really easy. You test it with people in the office. If you have relatives who still listen to you, you test it with your relatives and your friends, if they're still your friends. Ultimately, you may test them with mock juries. And what I've learned over time, whatever I thought or the trial team thought were good themes, more than half get thrown out. They're not very good themes. And we have to shift and retest, shift and retest. I recently had a case that went to trial, was on the East Coast. And the shifting occurred mid-trial. The case involved defibrillators. These are the devices. Um, I saw one in this building, every public building, shopping centers, office building, airplanes. Have these little devices. You see them on hospital shows when a patient comes in and someone says clear and they put the paddles and then the human body uh, reacts to it. But there are smaller defibrillators in public places now. And the different kinds of defibrillators use different waveforms. And a witness on the other side, th these were two head-to-head -head competitors, said, well, for certain kinds of patients, we consider them to be outliers. And outliers were people who happened to have higher resistance from their body. And the outliers, it turns out, were the 10 to 20% of the patients, if the defibrillator was applied in time due to a heart attack, as an example, it would have no positive effect on the patient, and the patient would die. And mid-trial, we had a new theme. The new theme was that other company was making defibrillators, and they didn't care about outliers. So outliers could be people who were a bit overweight or too skinny or for whatever reason had too much resistance in their body. Uh, so I have found over time that being willing to shift up to the day trial begins and even during trial 
can make sense. Mm -hmm. Judge Freeman, what have you observed from the bench as to effective and perhaps ineffective trial themes? Well, it, it's an interesting thing what effective really means because <laughs> I, uh, if it's only effective if you win, uh, I would <laughs> think. Uh, but what what I observe is that the jurors who are selected in my Silicon Valley courtroom tend to be the group that has the least technology experience that the pool will bear because the attorneys are meticulously excluding all of my PhD uh, jurors so that it is a group of common people. Now, in many of the, in virtually all other jurisdictions in the country, you don't have five PhDs in engineering who are in your first 12 jurors, but we certainly do here. And what I find is that a good story will so uh, enthrall the jury that I think that they start to root for one side. So in a biotech case, I had a case involving a truly transformative drug. But the issue of the case clearly wasn't whether the drug saved millions of lives. But that was the story that was told. And so by the end of the first witness, who was the scientist, the chief scientist on this, uh, this drug, the jury was so in love with and admired this man for saving millions of lives that, that it was going to be hard to go any other way. Uh, the David versus Goliath theme, I mean, that is a common one, but I had a trial involving a mechanical, it was HVAC equipment, so uh, in fact, a jury could understand that better than some of these more difficult things, but for the first day of the trial, of the, of the, de the defense case, we learned about the president of the company that was being sued, the little company, how he was an immigrant, and how he built up from nothing. He, all he came with were the clothes on his back and his engineering degree from his home country, and built a business. Again, the jury was looking for any way they could, and they did, render a verdict in their favor. Uh, and so themes are incredibly powerful. What, what I'm concerned about is that this jury actually is so afraid of not being able to understand anything that they are going to latch on to the things they understand. So they truly understand your theme. They really get it that this drug saved millions of lives or that this uh, president of the company is to be admired. We, we want to know him. We want him as our neighbor. He's just the greatest person on earth. Has nothing to do with infringement. Uh, and so, um, you know, I then am hoping, wow, I sure hope the evidence is there because, you know, I'm going to be scouring the record along with the lawyers on JMAL to make sure that the, that the actual work of the trial got done and that the theme didn't just obli obliterate the holes in the winning party's side. Yeah, Paul, did you see similar things during your time on the bench? I did. I, you know, one of the things that um, struck me as much as anything on, um, in terms of, of how themes resonate and how they can, if not overwhelm, certainly color the manner in which evidence is considered and weighed, is that audience matters a lot, mm -hmm. a lot. And I think Morgan is exactly right that you need to be flexible in adjusting and changing themes. As, as the theme rolls out across the pretrial process and into the, into the presentation of evidence. But there's a, an important step in between that I came to observe is, has, is most, most often a huge lost opportunity to craft and tailor themes, which is the voir dire, right? Whether, whether you have a, a, a tough judge who doesn't give you much opportunity um, to, uh, to, 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 to craft voir dire yourself, or you have more license and liberty to ask questions of the jury directly, you get a lot of very useful information from voir dire when it's done properly about who your audience is. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that, at least in my experience, I saw you know, only a few of the very best craft and tailor the themes that they were presenting in light of who actually made it into the box. Mm -hmm. Because if you think about it, there's no, other sort of, there's no other creative or dramatic presentation that I'm aware of where you ignore who the people are who are watching you know, the, the, the depiction that's being uh, presented, right? It, it matters a lot who those people are, and I think there's a lot more opportunity to land themes and land messages if you give more careful thought to who those people are mm -hmm. and, and how they process 
the information in front of them. So this is a little off script, but do you, did you use a voir dire questionnaire? So I did use a questionnaire, mm -hmm. and then I also would ask questions. Now, mm -hmm. I used to let lawyers ask questions of the jury mm -hmm. um, uh, as well. Um, there's a healthy discussion, I'll oh, put no, it that no. way. I, I, I defer to the attorneys for questions. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But as you know, there is there oh, a yeah. range of practice in the Northern District mm -hmm. of California yes. about that. Mm -hmm. But if, as I recall, you, you nevertheless ran things very tight and did not let the lawyers go on. Right. That doesn't mean, though, that there isn't an opportunity right. to mm -hmm. test some of these themes out in that process. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an important opportunity. Yeah, yeah that's, that's interesting. Morgan, is that something that you've had experience doing, testing out your themes during voir dire, and how does that play out? Boy, it really depends on who the judge is. Yeah. Uh, there, there are some judges that, that brag, not that the jury is fully selected uh, in the morning session, but the jury is fully selected by 10.30. <laughs> Uh, no if, ands, and buts. And th yes, they'll accept a few questions that they will ask, but that's about it. And as a practicing lawyer, we tend to learn very little. I, I wish there was greater leeway at least to take, accept, and ask the questions suggested by lawyers, or even better, to allow lawyers some latitude in asking questions themselves. Yeah. I mean, one thing that I have found is that uh, I do use a questionnaire, and in a patent trial, I use a lengthy questionnaire and give the attorneys the weekend to review mm -hmm. it. Uh, and I find that speeds things up. Uh, with those questionnaires, I rarely ask any questions. And I've really pulled back from being the questioner in the trial, in civil trials. In criminal trials, it's an entirely different thing. But I've found that the jurors want to please the judge. and most of them can figure out the answer they think the judge wants to hear and will work to that answer. And I think the attorneys do a better job, I think all of you do a better job getting at what the juror is really thinking than, than I do as a judge. And I'm just, I've just watched this over many years of the jurors trying to find me as the moving target to, to really please me. So you'd mentioned earlier that you find that attorneys try to eliminate the technical jurors. Yes. Do you see that on both sides of the V, or is that something that you see more happening you know, by plaintiffs than defendants? I see it on both sides, probably more on plaintiff. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, know, you have to work pretty hard in, the, in a San Jose courtroom to get rid of all the technical people, mm -hmm. because that's who we draw. Uh, and when, you're, when you only have six peremptory challenges uh, between you and uh, it's hard to knock people for cause in a civil case. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a trait. And I had a, um, a technology case, but it was not a patent infringement case. It was a, it was a contract case, actually, where of my eight jurors, uh, I had four PhDs from Silicon Valley and two MBAs filling out that jury, and I think I had a truck driver and a nurse or something. Uh, so it's, I mean, it's a real thing. If that's, if that, it's a real issue for lawyers. So, Sonal, you had mentioned when we talked earlier that you tailor your themes perhaps by the jurisdiction that you're in. Is that a, as the result of the jury pool or their? I, I mean, a little bit, that? right? I think, I think this goes to the point that Paul was making. We have an opportunity as trial lawyers to, to, as we're going through the process, think about who our audience is. I think it would be silly not to look at a jury pool that, like the one that Judge Freeman described and then a jury pool in a place where you're gonna have mostly high school graduates that are working blue collar jobs and say, I'm gonna try the same case to both of those audiences. That would be crazy, right? It just doesn't make any sense. And so I think there are certain human themes that, and stories that are universal and that there's an element of that sort of very high level storytelling that may be able to cross across jury pools and jurisdictions and all of that, but then the way that you actually execute on that narrative and that theme has to, I think, take into account not only the place you are geographically and the demographics of your pool, but as everyone on the panel has said, the specific people that you have in those chairs and what feedback you're getting from them in voir dire or just watching them during the trial mm -hmm. and what's, what looks like it's resonating and what looks like it has them nodding off. So, so how do you do that? How do you teach once you've got your, your jury in the box? Yeah, so I mean, I think the, the, 
honest answer is it's going to be all of the same things that everyone says when you ask that question, but that it is, it's very hard um, to describe it, right? I mean, you're, you want to start teaching your themes and your kind of core arguments in your opening. You have experts, obviously, that are going to come and do this. You're going to have demonstratives, and people always say, we need good demonstratives. All of that, I think, is true. Um, to me, I think really the experts play a, a big role in that. I think a lot of people use experts as a kind of box checking exercise and you will see people <laughs> literally, literally. that have their expert get up there and literally check their box and they sort of drone on for two and a half hours. It's like, if you'll turn to page 222 of my slides, this element is met by this. There is an element of that that is necessary in order to meet your burden of proof and then to have your evidence line up for JMAL and for appeal. But I think it is a huge missed opportunity to have your get expert get up there and do this as a box checking exercise as opposed to be a teacher, be somebody that can actually sit there and try to explain why this complicated data compression technology is as simple as the yellow sliding box, or maybe not quite so simple as the yellow sliding box since that didn't go over well, but a step <laughs> in between of those things, right? So I, to me, experts are huge, graphics are huge. And also, um, I think having in your opening and your closing enough of your actual evidence on the infringement and invalidity issues as opposed to just your narrative story so that the juries know how to take all the evidence that they're getting and actually map it to your verdict form. And Morgan, what about you? What kinds of creative ideas have you implemented and tried out over the years to enhance your comprehension of technology cases? First, I want to defend myself. <laughs> <laughs> On the yellow sliding window, we won the case. Um, the, the way to think about this is to think about it in a big picture conceptual basis. My wife for decades was a kindergarten teacher. And I remember the first times I was in her classroom and the umpteenth times I was in her classroom. There was this wonderful image that repeated itself. She'd be teaching some children something and then a child would go to her leg and hug her. Think about that image. It's that gift of learning something from someone else that is so precious. So if you think about that conceptually, you want the jurors to be hugging you so that they trust you. They feel as if even though they're not supposed to go home and tell people back at home what happened at trial, at some appropriate time, they're going to say, you know what I learned? And they'll be so proud that they learned something that other people don't know about. So start with the concept. Second, I don't think that there's any one best way. I can tell you that I do believe that one way that is often used is a bad way. And that is to have the march of PowerPoint slides. They're overused in opening, they're overused in closing, they're overused in direct, they're overused in cross-examination, they're overused in academic lectures, and it goes on and on. So think about the fact that you want to witness, let's say it's on direct examination, or an opening statement. You want your witness to connect with the jurors. Well, the jurors are just looking at this blizzard of slides. You want to connect with the jurors. If you have this blizzard of slides, they're looking at this blizzard of slides. So it's not to say never use PowerPoints, but use them judiciously. I think they're badly overused, and as a result, they're often a negative kind of teaching tool. Think about simple kinds of props. We had a case that involved very complex biotechnology. And a key scientist had done some wonderful, groundbreaking work. And he was one of the people who first tricked bacteria into making human proteins. So the lowly bacteria, like any other 
living organism, they want to reject foreign substances. So how do you get human DNA into a bacterial cell and convince this bacteria that it ought to make perfect human proteins, become a factory, a pharmaceutical factory? And we thought about PowerPoint slides and all other kinds of ways. What we ended up with at trial with was a Kleenex box. He said, just think of this Kleenex box as a bacterial cell. It's simple. And of course, you can put things in the Kleenex box. And he used that on the stand to explain the work that he and other scientists had done. He gets to have eye contact with the jurors all along the way. So a simple prop like that can be far more effective than some fancy animation or the blizzard of PowerPoints. Another example, do not forget that words by themselves can be awfully powerful. Words can be the most powerful. Some of you, uh, as was the case with me, watched some or maybe a lot of John McCain's funeral. And for those who eulogized him, it was words. And I was thinking about what were some of the greatest eulogies I ever heard. Now it happens that I think one of the best ever was Teddy Kennedy's eulogy of his brother Bobby. It was just words. So I'll give you an example from a trial. We were trying to teach the concept of $30 billion. All human beings, and I include myself, really don't know what $30 billion is. Maybe there are a few people, maybe Mr. Gay, Mr. Bezos, and a few other people know what $30 billion is. I have no concept of $30 billion. I have a concept of $100 or $1,000, $30 billion. And so everyone on the trial team and consultants had ideas. Oh, well, we're going to take $20 bills, $100 bills. We'll wrap it around the earth. We'll go to the moon and back. Well, maybe we can go to Mars with it and all kinds of other ways <laughs> of depicting $30 billion. And then I tried out just doing it in words. Suppose you earn $30,000 a year and you were really lucky. You didn't have to pay rent, you didn't have to buy food, and you didn't have to pay any taxes. And you could say that $30,000 every year, year after year. How many years would it take to get to 30 billion? Now, one of the first people I tried it out on was this damages expert. Not his area of expertise, of course, but he has one of these fancy reverse Polish calculators that does things in half a second. And he said, oh, and he came up with a number. He was wildly wrong. And I said, a million years, a million years. And Christ was born 2,000 years ago. The great pyramids of Egypt were 4,500 years ago. A million years. We actually used it at trial because we thought it had, we wanted to make a big impression on the jury as to how big a number $30 billion is. And back to my damages expert, he said, really? He uses his calculator, and he still came up with the wrong answer because the difficulty, as good as you are in a calculator, is where to put decimal points or <laughs> commas and things like that. So don't overuse PowerPoints. Simple is often better. Don't forget the use of words. Thank you, Morgan. Um, it's, it's obvious to all of us why Morgan is a legendary trial lawyer. That was, that was, that was beautiful use of words as well. Um, at what point in the trial do you think, and I'll go to you and Thonal as well as the, the judge and former judge, do you think the jury really starts to grasp what's going on? You know, do you think that the openings are the most important thing in terms of 
you know, getting the jury on your side and getting them to start understanding the journey they're about to go on, you know, do you think it's not until closings that it all kind of gels for them? You know, is it in the witness presentations? I mean, to me, it's, it is all of the above, right? I mean, I think you have to start getting their attention. And as, as Judge Freeman was giving anecdotes of sort of getting them to be rooting for you from the very beginning, I think if you're waiting for, until closing to try to get the jury to understand what your arguments are, you've already lost because they are already rooting for someone and they're sort of viewing the evidence through the lens that they want to view it through. Mm -hmm. So I think openings are really important. I think voir dire is really important. Mm -hmm. I think every minute you're in front of the jury, you are connecting with them, you're, they're making an impression of you, of your story, of your client. And so for me, it's sort of, it's all of the above. That being said, I think closings are important because I think there's a huge volume of information that is giving, getting delivered to this group of people in a very, very compressed amount of time. And it is not always clear, I think, to jurors where all of that fits in. So you will see this witness and that witness and witnesses get taken out of order sometimes and there's fact witnesses and experts and sort of all getting thrown at them and there's not a lot of structure. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna talk later about things that can be done to help give them structure. But there's not a lot of structure and I think the closing gives you structure so that when they walk into the jury room to deliberate, they know how you know the person they're rooting for, how the evidence actually lines up mm -hmm. with how that person would come actually win when you look at the verdict form. But I'm, I'm curious to hear Morgan's thoughts on that too. Well, I'm interested in hearing the judge's uh, thoughts yeah. on it. Well, you know, uh, what I've observed is that juries take some time to learn mm -hmm. how to be jurors. And so, although I think the opening statement is really important, I think a lot of them don't know what to listen for yet or how to listen. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's an environment they haven't found themselves in ever. Uh, and I, I say that based in part on the fact that at, when I was a state court judge, I tried both very short cases and very long cases. And so I could have a two-day trial on a, a, you know, a, a driving under the influence case or a three-month trial on some complicated issue. And inevitably, the juries that wanted read back were from the two-day trial. They hadn't even figured out what to do before it was over. They hadn't realized they had to listen before it was over. Uh, and so I think, although you, you have to balance being repetitive because a lot of people hate that, what I've come to feel is that uh, I actually, I think closing argument is very important for jurors. They don't know how to piece it together and it's come in, in it, it just doesn't come in in the order that life happens because each witness tells their own story. That I, I have tried to push lawyers to doing many summary statements throughout the trial. I can't get buy-in from both sides. I get a lot of pushback to the point where- I got it once, did, did but you, only once. But only once. Yeah. And I just really think it helps the jury to know what, know what to listen for or to know what's coming next. And I, I would really like to use it more, but you know, by the time you get to trial, not many lawyers are that flexible to do something different. I like a mini opening statement before voir dire. I can't get, most lawyers will not agree to it uh, because they're not, they're, they're so vested in how they've prepped that they can't, they can't change. Yeah, I, I mean, I love that idea. And you know, I, I felt like a lot of our jurors in our recent trial, which was pretty complicated technology, were lost during the witness presentations. You know, they didn't understand what they were supposed to be listening for. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them didn't seem to really understand cross-examination generally. But what was your experience on the bench and how did this case go where people actually did make interim statements? Uh, well, my experience on the bench actually causes me to question the premise of the question. To make this more interesting, I'll, I'll dispute yeah. the premise and let's see if we can generate some debate around this. The question you asked, Stephanie, which is entirely reasonable, is when do jurors in a trial get it, in a patent trial in particular? I think we have to look rigorously at the science and honestly ask, do they ever get it? Yeah. <laughs> do they ever get it? Yeah. And as trial people, trial lawyers, trial judges, we love juries. I, I haven't yet met another judge, at least, who doesn't love the Seventh Amendment, who doesn't love the jury process. But the science around this or surrounding this is to the extent it has been conducted is pretty damn clear that in most patent cases, most of the time, jurors don't get it at all. Now, we all love the Seventh Amendment, especially those watching on television who may be observing this proceeding. Uh, 
the reality, though, is right. We have to work with the rules that we, we are given. And so I think it's important to, to ask, when do they get whatever they're going to get mm -hmm. that they're going to apply in making a decision, whether it's themes, whether it's a sense of righteousness. When do they pick who they're rooting for? <laughs> when do they pick who they're rooting for? I think yeah. that's, for that, that's probably the yeah. more salient question yeah. and the more accurate mm -hmm. question. And I do think that um, that process begins the very first you know, minute they walk into that courtroom, mm -hmm. right? Even before the jury is selected, even before voir dire has begun. Um, one, one reform that, that I adopted from my practice in my early jury trials that I thought made a huge difference in giving that jury a chance, a fair chance to latch on to some narrative, some sense of righteousness, some person to root for uh, uh, more than anything else, was after I picked the jury, I sent them home. I gave them an afternoon to process the fact that they were not going to be sitting in judgment of others. Because in the work that most of us in this room do every day, making judgments is just what we do. It's what we've been doing in some cases for many, many years. That's not true for a lot of people. And that responsibility, that authority, can feel weighty, can feel awesome for a lot of people. And I, I found that when I gave them the chance to process that, to think about where their kids were going to go after school, if the trial was going to go past the end of the school day, all that stuff that you have to work out, it gave them a much better chance to process the information that begins with opening statements and continues from there. Just on the subject of, of summary arguments, I'm delighted to hear that at least there's one other judge trying. I, I think it is you know, very easy to implement and frankly very generous for the jury to give them that opportunity mm -hmm. on a Friday afternoon at the end of each week of trial, even if it's only a two week trial, mm -hmm. to process and synthesize everything that's happening. You know, if you think about it, there is no other um, educational exercise that we undertake where we structure the presentation of information and the test at the end the way that we do with jury trials, right? Mm -hmm. We never tell people learning, looking to learn a subject as complex as microbiology, for example, to sit down in a room, shut up, don't talk to anybody, certainly don't talk to each other about the one subject you all have in common and, you know, for weeks on end, and to sit there, mute, processing information coming at you in all sorts of uh, forms and, and, and fashion. So I think that you know, that is an excellent way to at least bridge the gap mm -hmm. to some degree. And I think we need to do more of that to give jurors a sense that they are actually um, competent to do the job that they all want to be very proud of at the end of the trial. So, so speaking of asking jurors to sit there mute, you allowed jurors to ask questions when you tried cases from the bench, right? I did, yeah. Yeah, and how did that work out? I thought it was fantastic. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I, the reason why I thought it was fantastic was, again, it gave the jury an opportunity to pr feel like they had a, a say in the process and a stake in the process. The Ninth Circuit has excellent rules and guidance for, for how judges can do this fairly. Um, more importantly, I felt like it was a fair, it gave, it gave a fair opportunity to the trial lawyers to get some real-time feedback on what's weighing on the jury's mind. And, um, to, and to course correct in the way that you know we were dis discussing a minute ago. So I'm a big fan of it. I think there are legitimate questions and concerns that can be raised about, about the process. But I think particularly in technical cases like most patent cases, it's at least an experiment worth running in each courtroom to see if the jury leverages the opportunity to, to better engage with the case. I, I think of trials as communicating with jurors. And I think of having a toolbox. So the traditional toolbox has a tool that's called voir dire, opening, closing, direct, cross. I love many opening statements before voir dire. I've had interim arguments or summations a number of times. Uh, sometimes they've been frequent. Once I could just say, after witness X is done, I'm going to use five of my 60 minutes of interim statement time, and the other side says, okay, and I'm going to respond and use three of my 60 minutes at that point. You could have two sets of interim statements in the same day. It can be that witness just said the following. Here are the three big points I want you to know about that. Or the next witness is going to tell you about the following. So. Any tool that helps communications, I also think 
allowing jurors to ask questions is a wonderful way that jurors can communicate to the lawyers what they're not understanding or what they want to know more about. So communications being a two-way street is very important. I think that sometimes we as lawyers, particularly in technical cases, but in other kinds of cases as well, we're far too ambitious. We're too ambitious in our use of each of the tools. So let me give you, well, I'll give you two examples. One, one example is what I tell more junior lawyers at our firm if they're going to cross-examine someone, and I'll use the cross-examination of an expert witness. Think about the following. That expert for 25 years has been doing X. She really knows X. She has a PhD from top university, a postdoc from another top university, has been teaching in the field. You don't know 1% of what she knows. Think of her as if she's Muhammad Ali, and you are going to box with her in her ring. You're going to ask her questions about the subject matter she knows backwards and forward. So think of it this way, if it was Ali. Ali is jumping around the ring, and he's catering to the crowd, and when he's got his back to you, you slip through the ropes, give him one or two rabbit punches to his kidneys, and get out of the ring. <laughs> Don't be too ambitious. Decide where you can land a few blows and not get knocked out. I'll give you another quick example. I'll use one from opening, and the easiest way to do it is not have an overly technical case. Sally was very excited on a sunny day as she was walking to her neighborhood elementary school and she was really looking forward to that day because of the activities she knew would, that would take place until she got to the crosswalk where her school is and her legs will never be the same. You can sit down. You're the plaintiff's lawyer. You know something terrible happened at that intersection. You know it was bright, sunny, no rain, great visibility. You know there was a crosswalk. The first witness that's going to testify is the accident reconstruction expert who would testify about the F-150 that came barreling down the street at an estimated 65 miles an hour. You have the sympathy of everyone in the courtroom. All the jurors' eyes go down and look at Sally's legs. You didn't go overboard. You didn't talk about the fact that she'll never be able to walk down the aisle. You didn't say anything about money. But you clearly affix blame on the defendant. But you notice all that was done in three or four sentences, and that was enough. With opening statements, I learned over time, my mistakes had to do with being overly ambitious. I wanted to cover every issue. I wanted to talk about six key witnesses or 14 different defenses if we were on the defense side. Be modest. Pick something where people two hours later could remember what you said. And I think in, in patent cases, it is so difficult because for many lawyers who gravitate to the field, it's because your minds work down in the minutia of these, this technology. And it takes a, a very skilled person to be able to work on both levels. I mean, and often, I'm sure your teams are put together is that your first chair trial attorney may not even have a technical degree because it actually gets in the way of the communication. Mm -hmm. and, and I have seen lawyers come in who I've never seen in the whole course of the case, waltz in and give the opening statement, and, and they are communicating with the jury because they are not mired 
in the technicalities. Uh, because, you know, as lawyers, we, we're, our ears are so finely tuned that we hear all of the, uh, of the mischaracterizations. It's not quite accurate, and yet we can, we can, we're not communicating anymore. I, I have sat through opening statements where I have, in the few times I've slipped and not given time limits, where I, you know, I wish I had the hook because the lawyer just won't stop telling what every witness is going to say and everyone is snoozing. You know, I think, it, I think it's a really tough line to walk because um, in juror feedback, we've heard everything from, you know, as a defendant in a patent case, your focus on the details seem desperate. Like that's what a defendant in a patent case is typically focused on to, you know, the, the other side's focus on telling a story seemed condescending and it seemed like they were trying mm -hmm. to avoid the details. You know, and you hear that from, from two jurors on the same jury in the same right. patent case and you say, how on earth do you thread that needle? Mm -hmm. So, Paul, what are some effective ways you've seen lawyers try to thread that needle and try to educate the jury, even if, you know, we've, we all probably share your view that in the end, you know, the education only gets so far. Well, I, I think that experts are important. I think that trial counsel is important. I want to talk about both of them. I think with respect to experts, um, one thing I absolutely came to appreciate uh, over time is that the talents that mark that expert or, or make that expert appropriate to, to, to tender the report, perhaps even to present the deposition testimony um, and to you know, avoid summary judgment, are nece not necessarily the talents that are um, best suited to succeed in, in trial and in the courtroom. And I, I, I certainly wonder whether or not that end game, that last uh, responsibility, is, is given enough thought in picking the experts at the, at the beginning of the process and in the first instance. So I think that focusing on that talent above all others is, is, is critical to, to having even a chance of success with the jury. Um, and, and with respect to trial counsel, um, in addition to everything I think Morgan shared so eloquently, what I, what I would add is that um, yes, sometimes less is more, almost always less is more, right? The curated experience is always superior to the, to the, to, to the disorganized um, or the uh, unstructured. And I think that the, the, I have seen trial counsel succeed with jurors even where they are not the most articulate, even where they, the words do not flow out of their mouth, even where they stumble and bumble on occasion, where the jury has a sense that even if they are not articulate and eloquent in their presentation, they are meticulous in their preparation and meticulous in their organization. You know, that's the, that, that is certainly one of the qualities I used to appreciate the most um, watching trial lawyers perform in front of me, that sense that they had control, that sense that they could stand at the podium with few or no notes and describe the rationale of the case, the point that they're making, to have the record at their fingertips, that comes across in spades. And it comes across not just to the, to the jurors, who are of course most important in a jury trial, but also to the judge. And that gives both audiences a, a great deal of confidence that they can trust what that lawyer has to say and trust that the points that lawyer is making are important. Well, I certainly think trust is important. And jurors are spending a lot of time looking at the lawyers and the lawyer team so all that body language is being read by the jury and is being taken in. Mm -hmm. They watch the witnesses while they're testifying. And they pick up on, they are looking for credibility points. I think that's a really important point. Uh, I once listened to an expert tout his academic qualifications, but the opposing lawyer picked up on his exaggeration of his university position and hammered it and hammered it and hammered it because he said he was a professor and he was a distant adjunct lecturer who occasionally came to the university as it turned out. And that stuck with the, with the jury. They didn't believe anything that expert said because he, he was not truthful about who he was. Uh, and with, I mean, with experts, I think, it, I think it goes without saying, jurors want people who are really doing the job, who are authentic who have been in the field, who actually perhaps teach students or have actually written the books. 
Uh, and so as opposed to professional experts, which they can, you know, so I think economists really have a hard time. I think economists give ridiculous testimony, frankly. Uh, and, and I will say, and, and it's not because they don't know they're, what they're doing. It's because lawyers de devote so little of their trial time to developing the economic model that, I, I mean, I've read the econo economist report, unfortunately, I have to, and I listen to what they say, and it's like, you know, we're just pulling this number, and, um, and so, um, you know, it, it's, I don't know what the jury's left with. They come up with a number that they like from closing argument, I think. Mark, do you have a question? Yeah, can I just ask uh, on that? I, I mean, I think one of the reasons uh, lawyers would say we don't actually spend much time developing this is that um, there's a real danger in focusing a lot of time on a damages case, especially if you're a defendant. Should we be bifurcating? Damages. So you're you're right. The defendants don't spend any time on it, but it's the it's the plaintiffs' damages expert that I'm really talking about because they go through all the Georgia Pacific factors ad nauseum. The jury has no idea. They're checking boxes, and this is neutral, and this is up and down, and and it's dizzying. But it's 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 like where's the beef on this? It it it's really it's always troubling to me. I, you know, the Federal Circuit's usually okay with it until they're not, although damages, it's a, it's a rough go on damages at the Federal Circuit in the last couple of years. Well, I mean, no doubt we could plan an entire day-long conference about the, you know, ridiculousness of patent damages law, and I think that obviously <laughs> plays out in, in um, jury trials. You know, I, um, Morgan mentioned, you know, running your themes by family members, and um, my husband has, he'll be mad at me for saying this, if he'll never watch this video, but he calls himself the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Common Sense. And I bounce my ideas off of him. And it's the damages ones he always has, you know, a, an objection to. That doesn't make any sense. It's like, but, but you have to accept the premise that patent damages law doesn't make any sense. And then within that rubric, does this argument make sense? You know, and I mean, if he can't get it, you know, he's a, he's a Stanford MBA. If he can't get it, you know, how are we explaining damages to, to jurors and how are they understanding why they should care about these, you know, minute factors that, that every damages expert, you know, really obsesses over covering? I wanted to build on something that Judge Freeman said. If you think about all trials and ask the question, why does one side win and one side lose? I think it boils down to one word. It's credibility. Mm -hmm. I'm not limiting it to patent trials. All civil trials, and I've done some criminal trials. It ends up being credibility. Now just focus on patent trials for the moment. There are usually opposing experts on liability. They all have sterling credentials. They are all articulate. But the jury is ruling in favor of one side over the other. It's a credibility contest. And there are members of the credibility team that include the lawyers as well as the fact witnesses and the experts. And as one side's cre overall credibility tends to diminish, there, if you could graph it, there's a curve that gets to a certain point where it just plummets to the ground. Mm -hmm. And so you got to watch that, that that's not your side. You got to watch that one of your witnesses did not become incredible in a way that damages your whole side, even on small details. Can I actually, Mark, Please. can I answer your question? Please. Which is, yes, of course damages should be bifurcated. That's not going to happen, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and, I'm, and, and as a practical matter, I, I, it's not going to happen. And I'm sympathetic to why most trial judges, I think, you know, would resist that uh, pitch, just as a matter of you know, managing their dockets and managing the process. I will say, though, that I think there's an, um, an important, perhaps even more important, tool that gets at the same problem as, the, as, as perhaps bifurcation might and that Judge Freeman identifies, which is Rule 703. I think that when it comes to damages experts and damages analysis, all the tools that are necessary um, to, to present or, or to protect the jury from incredible evidence are right there in Rule 703. And if we took an honest, meticulous look at whether or not 
the standards for expert testimony articulated in the 700 series rules are being met by most patent damages experts on both sides, I think we would all have to agree that most of the damages testimony presented in our district courts in this country shouldn't be there, just shouldn't be there. So Paul, I have a question for you. As a, as a client, do you want your damages case bifurcated or are you seeing that more from your perspective when you were on the bench? Well, I'm an American, and I, so I'm, I'm going to speak as an American you can citizen. Take, yeah, you can take inconsistent Look, I, positions with the two hats. No, I, I, I'll, but, I'll put both hats I mean, most of my on. clients don't want to, to bifurcate damages. They want to tell the story as to why there's no liability in the same context as why the damages should be low. Um, particularly given the interplay of the factors um, because they think it makes them look like less bad guys if they do ultimately end up having to pay damages. Yeah, I, I, I don't think that necessarily is true. I, yeah. I, think, I, I think that we have had such little experimentation with bifurcated proceedings in the United States. I started off this hour or so talking about my juror, right? <laughs> Bifurcating liability itself into an invalidity and infringement you know, analysis I think is, is something that, again, academically or intellectually is something we should give much more mm -hmm. serious thought to. It's not gonna happen either. So I think it's up to the trial courts with the direction and guidance and support of trial counsel to implement some of those um, ideas in the trial proceedings that we do have. And I do think that bifurcation of damages should be on the table much more than it is as a practical matter. Morgan, what are your thoughts on bifurcating issues? Depends which side I'm on. <laughs> yeah. If on the plaintiff, I don't want anything bifurcated. Mm -hmm. It can lead to delay, and it depends also on what we mean by bifurcation. And I want the defendant to have the terrible, terrible position of saying, we're not liable, but if you <laughs> find us liable, the damages should be 10 million instead yeah. of 100 million, because it sounds like an admission to those good folks who are sitting in the jury box. But there are other tools. There's a true bifurcation where all you do is try liability, and then sometime later, six months later, if liability is found, you have another jury and try damages. You could have a phase trial. You can have one jury that hears liability, they recess, they decide there is liability, and then the same jury goes on to decide damages. Uh, where you put willfulness, most judges put it with damages. I'm not sure that's right. Uh, I have had judges have uh, three phases to a trial. Let's try infringement first, then uh, invalidity, and then damages and willfulness later. I think having more experimentation would be excellent. I also think that having uh, brilliant scholars like Mark doing studies on whether the outcomes are better, whether juror comprehension is better, getting feedback from judges who have tried patent or highly technical cases with different kinds of bifurcation, trifurcation, or phasing would also be interesting. I'm not sure that phasing adds to the burden of a court. I'm fairly sure that the traditional bifurcation where you do have a second jury does add a lot to the burdens of the court. Can I, can I just make a pitch? So I did a case where we tried invalidity only first, and then there were gonna be a series of infringement trials following that, just because it was a, a big multi-defendant case. And the patents were invalidated, and all of the subsequent infringement trials went away. And, and it worked really well in that case. I have other cases where we've talked about, should, you know, should we do invalidity only first? And there's reasons why we absolutely don't want that because we want the scope of the plaintiff's infringement read in the same case with their expert taking positions as to the scope of the claims for infringement purposes so we can cross them on that and invalidity. But I think the point that Morgan and Paul made, which is more flexibility is really, really important. And so for the judges in the audience, but also for the clients in the audience, um, maybe have that conversation and be a little bit more open to creative ideas on how to structure trials. I think people are very, very scared of what happens if you don't do the sort of normal, this is what everyone does, and are really worried about things going off the rails, and that's fair enough. But on the other hand, I think there's real benefits to doing creative phasing or trial structures when the case warrants it. So, you know, it all comes down to how do we know when a jury gets it right? Uh, how do, and so uh, you, I don't know how you do that. My benchmark always is did I get reversed after the JMAL motion? And, and of course, it depends on what you're looking for because 
uh, a JMAL and an affirmance on appeal only says that the lawyers were good enough to put substantial evidence on the record that, if believed, would be sufficient to establish the claims. And it doesn't tell you whether the prevailing party should have prevailed in a, in a sense of did they actually meet their burden of proof by a preponderance of the evidence. Uh, to make it more psychological is obviously complicated, but for, and, and I don't know of any studies that have actually looked at what is the right outcome. Can you compare a jury trial to a judge's findings of fact and conclusions of law where the judge gets to weigh the evidence? I haven't seen any studies that have tried to put those next to each other. Uh, but I'm not inclined to decide uh, bifurcation or really phased trials that are presented to me by the arguments of lawyers who are angling for the method that benefits their client. I, that's not my job. I'm look, so absent any of the more empirical information about how we reach a better outcome, a more accurate outcome, I have no reason to go down the road of bifurcation, which, and, and, and I guess I should say phasing in most cases because it takes time and I think it wears the jury down to have to keep coming back and going back into the jury room. Although you can prep a jury for understanding there'll be phases. I've even had lawyers who said, don't tell the jury there's a second phase on willfulness. If, well, because if willfulness is, is, is actually yes. phased later, they don't want the jury to know what's coming. Uh, so I say, it's all the strategy is all I receive from lawyers, mm -hmm. and it's not helpful. A closely related question is, did the parties get it right? And if you think about the fact that across all civil cases, a very small percentage of cases actually go to trial. Mm -hmm. So assume that in most patent cases, there are, in general, equally good sets of lawyers and equally logical decision makers on both sides. But guess what? 50% of the time, one side got it wrong. And that's interesting. All of that brain power on that one side, and they got it wrong. How could that be? I have an audience question. What about the notion that, that people float from time to time about uh, free trial uh, mediation on damages uh, on the theory that that will settle on we, cer we certainly mediate a lot of our cases right before trial, and we also end up settling a lot of our cases right before trial. Um, but, you know, Judge Freeman, you, you didn't actually order us to an immediate pretrial mediation. Yeah. What is your feeling on mediation right close to trial? Well, I think it's, I think it's very powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, what I never know is whether the litigation team is the team that, that is mediating or if there's a separate team that's mediating. And I think that can make a big difference because lawyers like to go to trial and they're very busy right ne at the time of trial. So I think it can be difficult to actually yeah. make it happen at that point. Yeah. Uh, but, but I think that's helpful. I mean, you know, there are some cases where damages are tried first. Mm -hmm. A, with a different jury. I've a always wanted to try that, reverse and, bifurcation. Well, you know, and of course, our damages. patent local rules now require damages mm -hmm. uh, to be uh, developed early in the case now. Uh, and we're just beginning to get some, mm -hmm. enough data on it to see if mm -hmm. it's helping. I don't think it's helped settle cases yet, but it would be interesting to just see the damages trial. Uh, but, you know, my view is, you know, I, I don't know that it saves time ultimately, mm -hmm. uh, so it's hard yeah. to be the outlier on that. Well, one audience question that I got before we ever even got here today, um, somebody said, if you're going to have this panel together, I'd like for you to ask, how do you prepare for trial? So I'd like to switch gears to that, and then we'll take audience questions from people who are actually, you know, raising their hand live. But Mo Morgan and Zonal, do you want to start us out? And then I actually want to hear from the judges and from the client perspective what you do to prepare for trial as well. There are two big categories. The first category, I'll call it logistics and procedural issues, and the other substantive issues. I would say 95% plus of the trials that I have are out of town. Um, the logistics today are really easy. They were really easy 15 and 20 years ago, but we have a routine. Uh, I'll establish a date that the lawyers are going to move to 
uh, Texas, Delaware, New York, Chicago, wherever the trial is going to be. Uh, some staff will be there two days earlier. It will always include someone from our IT department who's setting up the network. It will include several other people who, are, who know what they're doing. I don't have to say anything to any one of them as to what needs to be done. Uh, they all know. In terms of trial supplies, our trial library and everything, it's usually, I don't ask any question, and sometimes, of course, the staff trial team as well as lawyer trial teams have people who are going to trial the first time. There's also some procedural issues with lawyers. Someone has never done a witness outline before. So we have a series of classes. I say, here's the way we're gonna do the witness outlines. And it's got a certain format. The impeachment material is going to be in the notebook in a particular way, and every detail is there. We have a lot of sample outlines, and some of my colleagues over the years have put together detailed memos so that the younger lawyers are given something, okay, you're gonna try out with Morgan, read this memo, and it's a living memo. People add to it. Let me go to the substantive issues. Um, I want to know what every witness on our side is going to testify about. And I get a lot of that information by asking people to schedule for particular dates and times dress rehearsals. I want to see the demonstratives that the lawyer is going to use with a particular expert or fact witness. I want to sit in on the dress rehearsals. And I try to be quiet through most of the dress rehearsal, but invariably I'll have some suggestions. Why not do this? Why not do that? And then we may have a second or third dress rehearsal after that. Uh, we're always working on opening. Uh, we're always working on closing before the trial begins. But to pick up on some earlier comments, I have never, ever written out either an opening or a closing for any case, including when I'd been practicing one year and took a case to trial and I was doing the opening and closing. I'm very, I'm much more comfortable not doing that, but it also allows me to focus on the various audiences. So there's the jury audience, there is the judge audience, there, there are other audiences as well and it's much easier for me to see what's going on and to shift gears when I haven't written things out. So um, I'm actually similar to Morgan. I'm not a scripter. I, it's, it's actually very hard for me to deliver material if it's been written out before. I'm much better just getting up and talking to people. Uh, it just seems to go much better, so I, I'm the same way. I will have, obviously, a cross outline with the, the kind of key things that I need to get and the support for impeachment when I need to get it. Um, one thing that Morgan didn't cover that I think is really important is having people on the team that are dedicated to particular things, which he did address. But one thing that I think is really, really important is having people on your team that are going to handle your own witnesses, right? And so it's, it's super important to have people know what your witnesses are going to say, and then a set of people who are dedicated to spending time with your witnesses and getting them ready, and that set of people should not be Morgan. Morgan's gonna wanna be involved in sort of, I presume, in, in sort of what the overall narrative is and what people are gonna cover, but there should be a group of people that are not doing the key crosses, that are not doing the opening and the closing, that are just spending time getting your witnesses ready. I think that is a piece of trial practice that is overlooked, and people get so caught up in the fray of the war room and the cross tomorrow and then this and then that, and they have their witnesses sort of sitting down the hall in another room on ice and not getting really getting them ready for, um, for what is to come. And our own witnesses, I think we all love the sort of thrill of cross-examination and it's fun and it's sort of what people think of when they think of trial lawyering, but your own witnesses is such an important part of the story and making sure they actually come and deliver and are ready for cross is super important. The other thing I wanna do is just is give a plus one to Morgan's comment about the run-through. So I think a lot of people do mocks. Um, mocks are fine for refining themes and for you know sort of helping your team get ready in terms of what arguments you're gonna run. 
and not run. They don't do much for your witnesses. They do nothing for your witnesses. Um, I've had cases where we've actually just had days dedicated to full run-throughs with a witness, where you put them in a room, not with the jury, but you put them in a room with a bunch of people from the law firm, the client, whatever, and do a run-through of their direct, and do a run-through of a cross with another lawyer, and really put them through the paces of that. It helps refine your trial presentation, and it helps your witnesses get ready. And so I, I think that is, it's, really underutilized. I think people put a lot more emphasis on jury exercises and not enough exercise on witness run-throughs or dry runs. So before we completely run out of time, Judge Freeman, I'm particularly curious as to what you guys do from the bench to prepare so, for trial. You know, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an entirely different experience, of course. It's only at your summary judgment motion that I begin to really understand your case. I've learned about your technology. I've construed some terms. I don't really know where that's going. I may or may not have had motions during the case, but probably not other than summary judgment. I might have had 101 motions. So I learn about the case in a very contorted way at summary judgment. When I get your motions in limine and your jury instructions, that's when I really learn about your case. I learn about your case in my jury instruction conference. And I once had a lawyer say to me, and it's carried through with me for years with the waiting for the rulings on the motions in limine. He said, Judge, I don't even know what case I'm trying until you rule on these motions. And I thought, wow, that's exactly right, because he doesn't know what witnesses are in or out. He doesn't know what evidence is going to be in or out. He doesn't, can't read where I'm going to be going during the trial. Uh, and so I'm playing catch up. Most of us are at the trial. And so I, one thing that I do where I guess I really learn about your case is in my uh, jury instruction conference that I hold uh, several days before opening statements. My jury instructions are done before your opening statement. And you have spent a day in chambers with me going over every word and every jury instruction where I'm testing your theories against the instructions to make sure that I understand them. And probably doesn't apply to any of you, but in the broad swath of trials that I have, I also am trying to learn whether the lawyers understand what they have to do to prove their case, if they have any idea what the elements of their claims really are uh, and how they have to prove the case. So that's, that's probably the most important point in the, in the case for me really knowing your case is when I do your jury instructions. Well, and, and finally, and I promise this is my last question, it's for you, Paul. You've seen this from every side. You've seen it as outside counsel, as a partner in a law firm. You saw it as a judge and now you see it as a client. You know, what do you think are the keys to you know, trial preparedness and a winning strategy among your trial teams? So the one thing I, I will say from the seat that I currently sit in is that when our cases go to trial, I ask my senior leadership a very simple question. Are you prepared to lose? Are you prepared to lose this case and lose it badly? Because if the answer to that question is no, then we shouldn't be going to trial in that case. The flip side to that is every single case we take to trial, we are absolutely prepared to lose and lose badly. And I think that frames the question for the people ultimately responsible for the outcomes of these cases in a way that's helpful. It's helpful for their thinking, but just as important as helpful for the trial teams. All right, well, we are, we are completely out of time. Um, I suppose I'd ask if anybody has questions for the panelists, you can just approach us informally during the reception. But thank you all for being a great audience on a late Friday afternoon. <laughs>